Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you all here this morning. Hey, we get to worship and praise our God, the one that woke us up this morning. We get to use the breath that he's given us to bless his name. Anybody excited about that today? Okay, well, I want to welcome, I want to welcome the people of God all over the world. We know a lot of people in a lot of different continents. We want you to know that we, we love you and we want you to join with us, one heart, one spirit, as we bless the Lord's name. Y'all ready to do this? Amen. Amen. Make his praise glorious. Hallelujah, everybody. Is that enough, dear? Okay. Thank you so much, Sister Stephanie. Let us start. Let's raise a hallelujah to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords this morning. He's a word. Yeah. 
are still showing up at the tomb of Mary Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. Right now, I know you're ready. the battle, no, you never lost the battle, and I know, I know You are worthy. 
You are holy. You are the righteousness of God.
Blessing, honor, glory, and power to him who sits on the throne. Amen. Lord, we just honor you today. Lord, we give you the praise and the honor that is due your holy name, O oh God. It's all about you. This life is all about you, O oh God. Knowing you and making you known. Making your glory known throughout the whole earth, O oh Lord. May our lives exalt you. May your glory be manifested in our lives, oh God. That men might see you in your body. See your life in your body. And ask, what must I do to be saved? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the privilege that we have to call upon you. You said that if we had any needs at all, any need at all, small lords, they all matter to you, God. We know that everything that concerns your body concerns you, dear Lord. So Lord, we're coming to you, placing these needs at your feet, leaving them there and worshiping. Lord, we know that you're the one that heals. So we're asking that you would heal all that need healing. And we know that there are many. Lord, we're asking that you would comfort those that are grieving today because of the loss of a loved one. Lord, we know that you're able to bind up broken hearts. Lord, we know that you're able to gather the pieces and put them back together so that we may go on. We never get over those we love, never get over, but we're able to go on with them in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for that, oh God. We pray for those that are experiencing financial lack. Lord, we know that you're able to supply every need. We know that you are our shepherd and we will not lack. When I look across this room, what I see is a group of people that have been given everything that they've ever needed their entire life. Amen. Everything we've ever needed our entire life, you have supplied, and we know that you will not stop now. So, Lord, we say thank you. We say thank you. Lord, we thank you for moving in our midst this morning moving in our midst and already beginning to minister, minister to us, Lord. I pray that every heart would be open and ready to receive what you have for your body today. You move in the singing, you move in the praying, you move in the listening. Amen. If there's someone in here this morning that does not know you, Lord, I pray that they experience the true and only living God this morning, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the souls that were saved last Sunday in every service. So we know you were here because only Jesus saves. <laughs> the preacher might preach, but Jesus saves. Amen? Amen. You're going to move in the praying. You're going to move in the giving. You're going to move in the listening. You're going to move in the preaching. Lord, you've made a promise in this house that those that came with their hearts open and turned toward you, that nobody would go away empty. And your word says that your word never returns void. 
So, Lord, we're asking that your spirit would move and have its way in this place today. I pray that we would remain on one accord. The word says that you bless where there's unity. And I just believe that the more we're on one accord, the more we praise you, that the Holy Ghost would continue to pour down. We say poor church. We say poor church. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. And I look forward to what else you're going to say to your body this day. In the name of Jesus, saints. In the name of Jesus. Say with me, in the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Have your way in this place, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our boast. Christ Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul in turn says, Most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, to tent upon, to abide with me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul learned from the experience of the thorn and his encounter with the Lord that if he should boast, it should not be in human accomplishments, but rather in his weaknesses. That revelation is the polar opposite to the way the world sees things. The attitude of the world is to despise weakness in every form. The world's refrain is, only the strong survive. However, Paul, through his affliction in his flesh, rejected this refrain and came to realize that Christ's strength rested upon him in the midst of infirmity. For it was when he was weak in himself that the power of Christ rested upon him in an abiding and strengthening presence. His conclusion is mind-boggling as a result of embracing, even boasting in his infirmities, the power of Christ came to abide upon him from this abiding presence of Jesus. He learned to take pleasure in the things that most of us skillfully avoid. Because of God's grace, he was able to say, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, feebleness of mind or body, frailties, sickness, weakness, reproaches, hurtful, injurious, and overbearing conduct, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, in anguish, for Christ's sake. The apostle accepted all of these for Christ's sake. Many Christians, if not most, practice suffering avoidance rather than accepting these trials with joy for Christ's sake. But Paul embraced painful trials, although never seeking them. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Made perfect means that Christ's dependency is the perfect place for his strength to accomplish his goal. Often, believers are so impressed with Paul when they could have much of what he found, if not all of it. He makes plain his secret. Therefore, I believe the Lord through Paul and himself was giving us the pattern for living the overcomer's life. 
In Galatians 6, 14, he says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Is it your boast that you have lost interest in the world system? Is it your boast that the world has been crucified to you and you to the world? Have you embraced this word? For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Have you taken Paul's position in the midst of your trials saying, I want you to know that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Have your trials advanced the gospel? Have you allowed Christ's grace to be your sufficiency? From his experiences, Paul says, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance. The apostle Peter joins Paul in this revelation saying, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. For Christ himself was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. Let us take this revelation to heart and not be guilty of paying lip service to the scriptures, but let us embrace the Lord's revelation to Paul that Christ's strength would be made perfect in our weakness and that we would begin living as did Peter, Paul, and others, just as does Jesus by the power of God. At rest, Pastor Don. listen to the readings every su every Sunday it's like oh my goodness and Don just goes in there and gets quiet and writes and for don't be upset with me uh, he's been fasting more than a whole year now every other week seven days without food just water that's why he's thin now and uh, the Lord has been pouring into him these writings and ministering to him and through him and he preaches still internationally online you know and here I don't know how many times a week and meets and prays with people but God is just really moving in our midst he really is I mean the the, the church has endured much the church internationally has endured much but I tell you what, he said something upon this rock, the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. He will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. And that's the word. And that's the word also for every believer. And one of those lines in the in the reading said. Uh, uh, All these things that have happened to me have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. 
Paul was talking about the things that happened to him. And I know that things have happened to everybody. In fact, the gospel says, think, think it not strange, okay? It comes under the heading of life on earth and being a man <laughs> and a woman on the planet earth. But I was thinking that uh, not only is the gospel necessarily preached, but it also should be advanced in our lives. I can know that the things that I've gone through have taught me to pray more, to believe more, to be a more uh, fervent witness, to be a more generous giver. So I tell you, the things that I've gone through and the things that I have observed and seen and endured has caused the gospel to really advance in my life, not only in my works, but also in my life. Now I'm up here to, work, to welcome our guest. That was just a little something, something extra. You know, that kind of happens to you when the Lord moves. <laughs> okay, do we have any, anybody in here that's here for the very first time? Want to raise your hand? I'm looking. Somebody help me. Okay, this section, that section too. Okay, somebody help me. Put the hand high. The person sitting. Okay, right behind us. Anyway, I want to welcome you. Okay, if you would just, uh, you're, you're going to be handed a card and a gift. If you would please fill out the gift and put it in the offering basket. Fill out the, well, you don't have to fill out the gift. You can open the gift, but fill out the card. See, see, that would be me. I grabbed that bag so fast. God knows. We just want you to know that we're very glad that you're here today. And then there's someone over here. Okay. I want to welcome you also, ma'am. Okay, I want to hear. Sister. Guest. Okay, how did you find us today? A nurse. Oh, bless you. So you're with FEMA. God bless you. We're so glad that you found us this morning. Amen. Okay, and, and the lady behind us, I, I know who you are. I mean, I see you. I will know who you are. Okay, how did you find us this morning? Internet. Yay for the internet. Thank God for the techies. Amen. All you people on camera, think it not a small thing. Think it not a small thing that you are helping to advance the kingdom of God. Why don't we stand up and just really greet each other with a nice wave and smile. You know, you know, you can, your eyes can really talk. I know mine can. Yeah. So glad you're all here this morning. I'm so very blessed and encouraged by your presence. Okay, now, thank you. Thank you. Look, still loving on people. I love that. Okay, now we have some announcements. Okay, if you would turn your attention toward the screens. Hello, Fellowship family. Happy October, and may the Lord bless you. I'm Jennifer, and I'd like to share some announcements. Next Sunday, October the 10th, we will observe our 35th church anniversary. How amazing is that? We are so excited to take this opportunity to thank God for his faithfulness to us in establishing this great work. We want to acknowledge and celebrate what he has done for us over the past 35 years. In observance of our 35th anniversary, special services have been planned, and we want to inform you that on next Sunday, October the 10th, we will only have two services, one at 8.30 a.m. and the other at 11 a.m. Join us as we praise and give thanks to God together. Also, October is Pastor's Appreciation Month. What an amazing opportunity to give thanks and express our great appreciation to Pastor Don and Sister Marva. They are indeed a great gift to us all, and God has truly blessed us with pastors after his own heart. 
Please take this Pastors Appreciation Month to express your sincere love to them. And on Sunday, October the 24th, a special love offering will be received on their behalf. We invite you to prayfully plan now and participate in this special gift. The Food Pantry will distribute food on Saturday, October the 9th, from noon to 1.30 p.m. Now, the Food Pantry serves families in need in the 78412, the 78413, and the 78414 zip code areas, along with our fellowship families. If you live in these areas, or you are in need, or you know someone in need, we invite you to come out Saturday, October the 9th. The Fellowship will host a vaccination clinic against the COVID-19 virus on Saturday, October the 16th, from 8 to 11 a.m. in the MWC classroom. Registration is not required. This is a service offered to you, our members, along with everyone in the community. Please share this information with your friends and your family. Calling all men of the fellowship. Our monthly men's meeting is Saturday, October the 16th. All men are invited to attend. Beginning at 8.30 a.m., come and enjoy a hearty breakfast and a wonderful fellowship. And at 9 a.m., anticipate and enjoy a great word. Make plans now to be there and please invite someone. If you would like to be water baptized, please call the church office to sign up. We have taken precautions to ensure everyone's safety, so we will only baptize one individual or one family group at a time on Sundays during the 12.30 p.m. service. Thank you for your attention, and now we will continue with our worship service. May the Lord bless you richly and abundantly. Pastor Don, about uh, October the 10th, the, day, the time for the services, Okay, okay, they said uh, 11 o'clock, but we're gonna keep our regular service times, okay? 8, 8.30 and 10.30, okay? So remember that, messages will be going out to remind you, but also tell friends and, and uh, if they have seen or read something else, it's 8.30 and 10.30, that's next Sunday. And so they changed it after they changed it. So now they're changing it back. See, this is live, you all. Anything can happen at any time. I love that. I love that. Now it's time for our giving. Hey, Amen. We get to give. Yeah. I was, I was listening to the pastor uh, Wednesday night. I was at home. And uh, some kind of way you were talking about serving the Lord, making ourselves available. And uh, people feel that they just don't have the time, they just don't have the time. And it, and it came to me, we can never give God more time than he gives us. We can never give him more of our gifts than he gives us. In fact, we just can't beat God giving. Amen, we used to sing that when I was a little girl, every Sunday at offering time. No matter how you try, you can't beat him giving. This is the way we give. You can give uh, three ways. Cash, check, buy envelope. You can use an envelope, put your cash in. You don't need to put your, um, put your check in an envelope, but if you like that, we won't get mad. The next way is uh, online, cccfellowship.com slash give. That's online. And, or you can text, you techies. Uh, there's the number, then you text the 361-386-2565. And you text keywords for all the different giving options. I want to thank you in advance for your liberality and for the way that you just generously give and you make it possible for us to uh, serve and assist uh, people here in the community and all in many, many nations around the world. Amen. You help keep the doors open here and things looking really nice. And I just want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. And it's like and we have so many people that are choosing to serve. And uh, that really makes me happy. As I said, we're, I hear that. <laughs> we're going into our 35th year. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time in the pastor. What? We have completed our 35th year. And just to let you all know what that looks like, when we came here, Marcus Lavelle was in the fifth grade. 
Now Marcus Lavelle has a son in the university. We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> I remember, I won't go long, honey. You know how it is when you get old, you, just, we can, you can just talk. But uh, when very few members, 10, 12, and I was praise team, church hostess, children's church director, pastor John, to everything. And then the Lord began to trust us with people, trust us with his children, you know? And he's continued to add, continue to add. And it's just amazing. And I just want to say to everybody that's in here, when God tells you something, you know it's God. How, how we say, watch and pray. Just pray and watch him do it. Just pray and watch and see how he's going to do it. I don't care how difficult it seems. When, it, when it's something really big and yucky, I say, oh, I know this is going to be good. <laughs> Because he's going to really surprise me at the way he deals with this one. That's why they call him Waymaker. Can we give? Okay, let me pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for, for your provision. For your provision. Lord, for the way that you provide. You are our shepherd. David said that he didn't lack and neither will we. So we say thank you right now for everything you've given us. Trusting, it, trusting us with it in our hands, knowing that we're going to hear you and do whatever you say. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, can I say this? Uh, the next person that we're going to hear, we have a very special guest minister this morning. It's our brother Vince Walker. I know you've heard him before in all kinds of ways. He sings, he teaches, he serves, man of God. And along with him is his lovely, wonderful wife that is just as gifted, my dear sister Elizabeth. So receive him. He's coming with the word of the Lord for the people of, of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everybody. You know, I've said it before, and I think it's worth saying again. If Amy Villarreal is up on the platform, I can stand up here with confidence. Thank you very much, Amy. Her playing is wonderful. 
It is a delight to be with you here this morning. I always love speaking at the fellowship because you guys are so easy to talk to. And it is wonderful just to feel the presence of the Lord here this morning. Amen. It's just, it's a delight to get to be here, and especially after Elizabeth and I have been uh, a little bit under the weather, as many of you may know. Um, we got sick, and the church prayed for us. You guys prayed for us, and I want to, I, I can't thank you enough for your prayers. I can't thank you enough for so many people that called and texted and brought us food and just dropped it off at the door. And, uh, you know, they didn't want to come in and visit for some reason. I'm not sure why. You know, the house was open. We're just really hoping y'all would come. I'm just kidding. Um, but we got better. And we got better because of the prayers of the saints. And I want to tell you, our God is faithful. He's a faithful God. He is so true to us. There was one morning that Elizabeth was watching the service, and I think I was playing hooky. I was not feeling good. And I was laying down in bed, and I just I started weeping, just absolutely weeping. The, the Lord was just touching me so powerfully because I could feel the prayers of the saints. I could feel your prayers just washing over my body in a very powerful way. And so I knew from that moment on we were going to be fine. I knew it. So praise the Lord. I have a, um, only a limited amount of time and have a lot to say. So if you'll, if you'll buckle up and go with me, we're going to talk about something this morning that I think is going to be a, a blessing and a benefit to you. So let's pray and we're going, to get right, we're going to get right to work here. Father God, we thank you so much for an opportunity to dig into your word and to see what it is that you say that, that is so important to us and it's so critical to us. Father, I pray this morning that you would work supernaturally in the hearts of your people, and that you would cause the kingdom to advance, as Sister Marva said so beautifully earlier. Cause your kingdom to advance in us. Whether we're saved, whether we're unsaved, Lord, I pray that your kingdom would advance in our hearts. I pray for tender hearts, good soil, and that by the Holy Spirit, you would cause a powerful change to take place in us, that we might be connected to you in a new way this morning, in a more powerful way, in a more profound way. By your Spirit, through the Son, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is called Mere Connectivity. Mere Connectivity. And what I'm trying to, to drive at here is that there's a, an emphasis in this phrase connectivity, or in the, in the word connectivity, that I think that is a very, very powerful thing. All right? So in case you were wondering, and I know all of you woke up this morning wondering what the title of the message was going to be, and you wanted to know desperately, is that a nod to C.S. Lewis? And the answer is yes. So you can rest assured that's, that's what it is. Uh, C.S. Lewis is, is the author of uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, as many of you may know. And uh, he is, uh, he's also the author of a, a book called Mere Christianity, which is one of my favorite books. I love that because he takes the time to logically give you step-by-step -step processes for his rationale. And I think that that's... Um, a biblical rationale, and I think that's a good book I would recommend. So, one of uh, a quote from C.S. Lewis here, I think it'd be a good thing to start with, is that he says this, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I think that's a pretty profound statement. And, of course, as, as we know, as we're walking this thing out with the Lord, we know we're made for another world. We know without a shadow of a doubt that we're made to have a connection with God. So about two years ago, um, <clears throat> pardon me, about two years ago, I had a change in career. Um, by, by nature, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm kind of shy. Um, as, as many of you know, once I get to know you, I'm not shy. But generally, as a, as, as a general rule, I'm a pretty shy kind of guy. And so I'm very comfortable being alone. I'm very comfortable being by myself um, when there's no one else around. And the reason why that's important is that when I, when I started my new job, I was at home a lot. And I was by myself a lot. And, I, and as I look back on my previous career, something I noticed is that I was around people all day, every day. Right? So I had people that I was in contact with. I was talking to people, face-to-face -face conversations all the time. And... I took for granted something that I learned that was very powerful. In my 35, 36 years of life at the time, um, I had always had people around me. And so from there, moving into a place where there was no one around, right, I started to notice something. I felt lonely. Anybody ever felt lonely? You ever felt like there's maybe a, a, a something that's missing, right? So what I gathered from that is that even as an introvert, I can feel lonely. Right? Even as, as someone who is very comfortable being by themselves, I can feel disconnected. And I thought, you know, this is a, 
this is a pretty serious deal. And as I, I started thinking about it more, the Lord started revealing things to me. And he started showing me that connection is something that is a very, very deep-rooted issue, and it's much more than I had ever considered. So I want to give you some information about what I found about how important this actually is. So my first point that I want to discuss, I might use a big word or two in here. Don't worry, they're not on the test, right? We're, we're not going to have a, a grade at the end of this deal. But we understand that connection, connection is a very important thing, right? So my first point is that connection is something that God designed, it's something that, that God built into us. And so my, my first point is that connection is Trinitarian. Connection is something that is anchored in the nature of God and it's something that he's put inside of us. So we understand the Trinity, <clears throat> excuse me, the Trinity. I usually save those cracks for whenever I'm singing up here. Um, when, <laughs> when the, that was funny, you can laugh at that one. Within the Trinity, God is one in nature and three in person. Right? He's, he's one God. He's three distinct people. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, this, is, this is Christianity 101. Right? So each of these three are interconnected and interdependent. Right? We're co-equal. Um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit co-equals within the Godhead, yet they're distinct in individual personhood. Is this water for me? It is now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Co-equals within the Godhead, yet distinct and in individual personhood. And what's so interesting about this is that we find that Father, Son, Holy Spirit rely on each other. They depend on each other. In fact, there is a very, very powerful connection that exists within the Trinity. We see this facet very clearly in, in scriptures like John 10, 30, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Right? There's other, there's other scriptures here, but for the sake of time, let's, let's look at this. This is a very beautiful image, a very beautiful uh, representation of the connection between God and his inmost being, and how the distinct parts of our God work together as one. This draws on something of very, very great value for us. This facet right here, there is an abiding and unbroken, perfect connection here between God and God. It's rock solid, it's unflinching, it's immovable, and it's eternal connection. This is a huge concept, right? This idea that God is eternally connected to himself forever. I don't think I can emphasize the power of that quite enough. This is really, really big. So we're, Vince, I hear you saying all of this stuff about connection and you're talking about God and you're talking about the Trinity. How does that apply to me, right? I want to submit to you for your consideration in Genesis 127, God says that in the image of God, he created us. So I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps it is the case that you are Trinitarian by design. You are designed to have a connection. You are designed to be connected. You are designed to have this powerful connection with something that is eternal, is rock solid, is unflinching, is immovable. You are designed to have that. What's more so is that it's not just for people in the church. This is for everyone, every single human being. If you're a human being, this qualifies, for you. you qualify for this, right? God made this into you. You are made to connect. You are made to be connected, right? I know this is 830. Are you guys, are, 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 we, are we connecting? Is that happening? Awesome. That, I, got, I got one laugh out of that. Very cool. I love you guys. Y'all are awesome. Thank you, Sister Rose. This connection inside the Godhead is unyielding, it's unbroken, and it's perfect. And it's made so that we would understand something about God and that we would understand that this connection is something that's very, very important for us. It's a really massive concept when you think about it. So you were designed to maintain this perfect, unyielding, and unbroken connection. You were never designed to feel the opposite. You were never designed to feel Disappointment, pain, hurt, betrayal, or separation. This is really, really fascinating to me. You were never designed to feel those feelings. Perhaps this is why they resonate so powerfully within us whenever we go through a disconnection, a separation, or even death. Death of a loved one, death of a family member. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, he says that he has put eternity into the heart of man. 
So this informs us that we have the weight of eternal expectations built into us when God made us in his image. So here's the problem that this connection is broken. It's not, things are not the way that things are intended to be, that God designed them to be, right? There's a certain sense of, of oughtness of the way things ought to be that is not the way that it is now. And so we find ourselves in this broken situation. And so since we're, we are creatures and we've been disconnected from God since the fall in Genesis 3, something is very broken in us. We have this feature built into us that wants to connect. It desires to connect. We're desperate to connect. It's still there, and it's still trying to run this base program that's in us. We want to connect. We need to connect, but the connection is severed. It's broken. And we're left broken as a result. There's a hole in our heart. This is a massive problem for us as humanity. We have a real brokenness here that's a real consequence of the fall. And now we have to live with it. We have to live with being disconnected, feeling disconnected, real heartache, real pain, and real misery to cope with. The funny thing about connection is that this is not an option for us as humanity. This is a non-negotiable need. As as I'm doing my research on this and and finding what different... um, uh, different sections of scripture and even secular schools of thought. I found this quote from uh, Matthew Lieberman, who's one of the founders of social cognitive neuroscience at UCLA. It says, he says this, being socially connected is our brain's lifelong passion. It's baked into our operating system for tens of millions of years. Now, I don't know about that tens of millions of years part personally, but he makes a really good point, is that this is something that we are all created with. When even secular logic tells us and affirms what's written in the Bible, there's no, there's no contest. There's no disagreement here as all of humanity. We understand that this is an operation for all of us. So I'm not up here just speculating on things. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, to make matters worse for our situation is that we have a very real enemy to deal with that really wants to exploit this issue for us. So we'll we'll search the world over in our own broken way to find something or anything to connect to. And we do so relentlessly because that's the way that we're made. So connection is intentionally devalued. This connection that, that God made for us, the enemy devalues it and he makes it cheap. And he makes it to where if you can connect with with anything, the lie is is that if you can connect with this whatever it is, this thing, that it'll satisfy you. And it'll give you what you want. And it'll make you feel whole. And there's a lie in it. There's an absolute lie in it. Right? So we understand that because if you've been walking this thing out with the Lord for any amount of time, you understand that he's the only one that can satisfy you. He's the only one that can give you what your heart really desires and needs. Because he's the one that created us. So the enemy tries to mess us all up, right? He tries to to keep us disconnected, and he does that through a lot of different ways. And what's interesting is that everything has got, like, like the lights and the shiny. It's like, hey, look over here, look over here, look over here, right? You know, don't pay any attention to what's going on on this side. Look over here and connect with me. And what I found that was very interesting about this is that the enemy wants you to connect everywhere other than Christ. Everywhere other than Christ. Because if he can connect you anywhere else other than Christ, you're disconnected from the Lord. So if you're trying to connect with everything, that means you're connected truly with nothing. If that, if that hole in your heart is that huge, it's that massive, you're trying to fill it with anything that you possibly can. And you've tried everything. Try Jesus. Try Jesus. I mean, he's really... The only thing left that, that you haven't tried, give him a shot. See what happens. Jesus said it this way. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But connected to him, I can do all things. As Paul says in Philippians 4.13. Here's something that um, in Jeremiah 2, verse 13, it says this. For my people have committed two evils. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, 
And secondly, they have hewned out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I think this is, this is a very concise description of what we're seeing happening, is that we're trying to find the source. We're trying to find God. We're trying to find the connection. We're trying to find satisfaction. You know, like when you're drinking water on a hot day and your throat is parched and it satisfies you in some small way. There's a beautiful analogy here about how God is saying that we have forsaken the source of, of living water, and that's Christ himself. And we've hewn out for ourselves broken cisterns that can't hold water. So we're connected in places that are dry and empty and have no potential for life. We're connecting anywhere other than God, but it leaves us feeling empty, lonely, depressed, disconnected, isolated, separated from God, ashamed, guilt. And in doing so, we develop all kinds of coping mechanisms to try to deal with the brokenness and to deal with the broken expectations when we feel that we're not the way that we were made to be. If you think about it, this is the problem with all the entire world system of doing things. Now, I can't get into all of those details right now just for the sake of time, but this is connected to worship. Connection and worship are, are very, very similarly entwined. And so when, I, when I'm saying connection, what I'm saying is that what you're connected to is the object of your worship. And you, you, you give glory to it and you receive glory from it. You receive value from it. This is what makes you who you are. It's the identity that your whole entire life is built upon. And if you build your identity on something other than Christ, you're going to feel disappointed. You're going to feel broken. You're going to feel messed up because those things were never, ever meant to carry the weight that the creator God himself can create. He, he's the only one that can carry that weight. He's the only one that the weight of glory can fully fall on and your heart can feel safe and satisfied and at peace. This disconnection can be very, very serious. It can lead us to the point to where we even feel suicidal thoughts because we're questioning where our value comes from. Because if we're getting our value from something other than Christ, it's hollow and it's empty. And it's making us feel hollow and empty. And that's what the problem is, is that we're connected in the wrong place. We're connected to something that doesn't give us what it is that our heart so desperately needs. And that's fulfillment and satisfaction that comes from the creator who gave you that in the first place. You were designed to be connected perfectly through your creation by the Trinitarian God. He is the only one that can satisfy your heart the way that it was intended to be satisfied. This is to say nothing of, of the very real moral implications of worshiping God, that, worshiping a false God that is not the real God, right? Idolatry has its own moral aspects. God, one of, the, one of the Ten Commandments is that you shall have no other gods before me. That's God our Father talking to us, saying that there is no way for us to be connected elsewhere other than him and find our satisfaction. See, that's, that's not a... That's not a, a a mean God sitting up in, in, in heaven somewhere making mandates for us to do things that are bad for us. He's trying to say, you're disconnected from me. You're, you're digging in the wrong place. And I desire desperately for you to be connected to me. I desire desperately to give you what it is that your heart needs and desires and was made for. What I find fascinating about this as well is that it is not as though God has abandoned us without hope. See, enough with the bad news. Give me the good news. Give me something real that I can hold on to. And what's beautiful is that God sent Christ, Jesus, to live a perfect life that we should have lived and die the death that we deserve to die. Jesus cried out from the cross in Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've all heard that verse, but here's something that maybe we hadn't considered. The God-man, Jesus Christ, experienced the full cup of God's wrath, completely severing his connection from God the Father. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit have been eternally connected from eternity past. They've never known separation. And I cannot imagine the degree of ultimate suffering that Christ Jesus must have felt being separated from his Father. 
ultimate suffering that should have been, that should have fallen on us. Jesus experienced that disconnection so that we could be connected. Because without his perfect atoning sacrifice, we were eternally separated from God. Sin separates us from God. Our disconnection or connection elsewhere other than Christ separates us from God. There's no way for us to make it back in. If you remember in the garden, when Adam and Eve were removed from the garden and God set up an angel with a flaming sword back and forth, it's as though he was saying the only way back into the garden, the only way back into God's presence is to go through death. It's to go through certain death. And it's God's authority, the angel there represents God's authority, that we must go through death and through his authority the only way to get back to God. And so if we understand that, we realize that it took God being disconnected to make us righteous, to make us have the ability and access to go back into the presence of God. Our connection from God was broken in Genesis 3 at the fall, and we feel that separation in the natural man, but our connection is restored in the God-man, Jesus Christ. Jesus demonstrates this concept to us in John 17, verses 20 through 21. Perhaps it's better stated, he demonstrates the idea of how he desires us to be reconnected. It's a better way of saying that. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, Christ's intention here is that we may be one with him just as he is one with the Father. What a powerful and beautiful statement. God desires for you to be reconnected with him. God desires for whatever else that it is that will not satisfy you to not be in your life so that you can receive satisfaction in him. I mean, let's be honest. At the end of the day, all of us are operating in such a way that we just, we just want to be happy. We just want to do what makes us happy. Now, I realize the implications of that statement. It sounds very secular and it sounds very worldly. But if you're operating in such a way that you're willing to sacrifice your life to make God happy, he gives you satisfaction. That's a lesson for another day. But it's not that you're, you're acting in selfishness. You're not giving to get. You're giving because you want to glorify the Lord because he has so connected you and he has so blessed you that you desire to give back all that you are in order to worship him. That's worship in spirit and in truth. And that will cost you something every time. See, once we're in Christ, we've been brought back into connection with God. See, what was disconnected at the fall is reconnected when we're born again. The veil has fallen, the barrier has torn down, and Christ offers a perfect eternal connection with unhindered access, a restoration and redemption of the brokenness and pain we experience while we're disconnected here. It is our proper response to this miracle of Christ connecting us to God the Father to worship and adore the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So now that we live a life connected in the Spirit, we can worship as we go. This is our joy and this is our purpose in life because we're doing what it is that we've been created to do. You know, Sister Stephanie picked such a perfect song for us to worship with this morning. That song has been in my heart for quite some time and we talked about that just briefly um, over text. But in Revelation 4.11, it says this, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will, they were created and have their being. We are created to worship God, church. We are created to receive our satisfaction in him because he has so beautifully reconnected us. What a wonderful God we serve. What a faithful God that we serve. Even when we're faithless, he is faithful. And that's why we worship, because there's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like our God that we can trust in completely and totally and never be disconnected or disappointed.
everybody. What we're going to do here in a minute, we're going to receive communion in just a second or two. But I want you to know that the, the Lord is so mighty and with us. And um, we want to just continue what we have been, we've begun here today. I do want to make mention of, of Brother Mark Pettis. I think I saw his wife on the camera somewhere here today. She's here. And Debbie. Okay, Debbie. Yes. Uh, it's Debbie's sister-in-law passed away. And we want to, we're blessing you and we're praying for you. We appreciate you and Mark. We bless you in the name of the Lord. And Edward, where is Edward Clark? Are you here, Edward? Raise your hand, if you will. Yeah, Edward, we are, we are praying for you in the name of the Lord. That this surgery will go well. And that Jesus himself will be the chief physician in that operating room. In the name of the Lord, we give you the glory, Father, in Jesus' name. As you stand there, orchestrating everything, I bring I bring all of you in remembrance of our dear brother J.R. Fields, now approaching 102 years old, was operated on by God Himself. He had been sick, and uh, when he was a younger man, and God healed him supernaturally. Many years later, God allowed him to have a surgery. And the physicians asked, who did your surgery? He said, I've never been operated on. Yes, you have. Who did the surgery? He said, I haven't been operated on. He said, you have. I saw the most fantastic. He said, the best stitching I have ever seen. In the Is that amazing? That May that be your portion in Jesus' name. And we pray for Eron Burera. Burera. Norma, did I pronounce that right? Where are you, Norma Curia? Where are you, Norma? Yes. Burera. I said, oh, Barera. Oh, Barera. There's a U instead of an A. And so I didn't want to mess that up. So he is in the hospital. And uh, he is in a coma right now. So we pray for him for Iran in Jesus name thank you God wake him up heal his body we pray for the Davila family in the name of the Lord that you would comfort them in Jesus name Jesus name amen and we're going to serve our communion and sister Stephanie is going to be coming with a song and a team uh, we're going to go ahead and serve. I do want to give a shout out to Philip. Philip Johnson. In the name of Jesus. In el nombre de Cristo. Jesus. It's so good to see you. It's always good to see Philip. And, uh, you know, he was a, a child here in the church. And he used to work at one of my favorite restaurants. And just because I see you, when I'm eating again, I'm going to go to that restaurant in San Antonio. In memory of you. Uh, Philip, Philip just finished his master's degree, and I was just boasting in him earlier. Man, that's powerful. Thank you so much for continuing your education. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a big blessing to Philip. We're going to go ahead and serve you, and we'll come back in just a moment, and we'll eat and drink together. Just a step.
Thank you so much. Pastor Ken, thank you. Oh, wow. I love this scripture. This is the day the Lord has made. Because this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in the day, in the day of the Lord, the day of God's grace and mercy, in the day of Jesus Christ. We stand here today as his children. We are his sheep. We're his people. He is our shepherd. And we want to thank him for what he has done for us. We don't get to make this up as we go. He has already given us a prescription for our lives. Not only a description, but a prescription. And every day we, we should wake knowing that God is speaking to us through his son, Jesus Christ. He has done a great work through Jesus Christ. I'm always reminded of his death on the cross, how he died in my place, not just our place, but your place, my place. Make it personal. He took my sin upon him. It wasn't his sin. It was my sin. It wasn't his death. It was my death. And he did that so that we would have the right, the right to the tree of life. So I want you today to take your bread and just lift your bread, as it were, to heaven. Jesus was lifted up between heaven and earth. He hung between heaven and earth for you. I want you to take this bread because he promises us that if you and I would eat the bread, receive him, receive him, that we will never die. We would never die. I believe this. We will never die. And we will be with him forever. And as someone said so beautifully, we will be a trophy of his grace. A trophy of his grace forever and ever and ever. Let us eat in Jesus' name. The word of God is clear. That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And without the shedding of Christ's blood, you and I would never be able to approach God, our Father. We would not be able to approach the throne of God. We would not be able to live in His presence. We would not be able to be with Him forever and ever and ever. World without end. But Jesus shed His blood. He never spilled it. He shed it. Nobody took his life, as it were, but he gave it for you. And let us drink in the name of the Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Our brothers and our sisters are going to come down the aisle, and they're going to receive it from you because... We're not going to pass our cup to somebody else today. They'll come in and receive.
is a wonderful day. It's time for us to go. But I do want to thank my brother Vince for sharing the word today. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Stephanie, for leading us in praise and worship and your team. Thank you very, very much. Brother James is out of town because of a death in his family. And he was in Arkansas. And uh, there, I don't remember exactly where they are now, but they'll be back tomorrow uh, or this evening. I want to thank you, Sister Jadira, for reading. Uh, you, you do a, a fantastic job of that, actually. I always like the way the Holy Spirit leads you to read those articles because you know exactly where the emphasis is without being told that that's the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. And I take no credit for writing. I'm just the, the guy with the hand and the pen or the iPad. I want to thank our ushers and greeters, Pastor Ken. Thank you all. Thank you very, 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 very much for what you do. Y'all do, do a great job. Thank you, uh, uh, television people, Sister Rose. And all you camera people, camera, camera men and women. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And thank you all for praying for the people of God. Let's pray for them everywhere. Everywhere. My dad used to pray, Lord, I bless your people everywhere. And I, I didn't know I was listening. Thank you, Jesus, for your people everywhere. In Asia and Africa, Europe, here in North America, Central America, South America, Australia, and the islands of the sea. Thank you, Jesus, for your people everywhere. Amen. Now let us lift up our hands to the Lord. I want to just, we're going to bless the Lord and we're going to bless each other. Let's bless them. Why do we bless? I know that there are people who believe that that there are curses everywhere. I, I don't fight you about it. But the Bible says so explicitly when the prophet Balaam was paid, hired to curse the people of God. I mean, it was a monetary issue with him. He, he would increase, but every time he would open his mouth, a blessing would come out. And Balak wanted to fire him and maybe beat him a little bit. Hired you, I paid you to curse these people. But every time you talk, you bless them. He says, I can't curse what God has blessed. Amen. That's why we're going to bless you. There are not enough demons in hell to curse you. And we're not going to believe I, I'm, I, I'm not under a curse. Why? Why? Because I'm in Christ. He became a curse for us. He took our curse that we would become the righteousness of God in him. That's who we are. The righteousness of God in Christ. Let's bless each other. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name, I bless you. In Jesus' name, I bless you. Let's go with God, everybody. <laughs>